May the pure, life-giving truth of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ forever remain for you your single greatest and most precious possession, dear fellow redeemed. In the text, an unexpected question comes to Jesus, the sort of questions that skeptics then and skeptics now love to ask. They did not believe him to be the Messiah. They did not believe Jesus to be the very Son of God who is full man, full God, come to the world to take away our sins and therefore redeem us. And there's just something about sinful man. And maybe we could just simply say it's our fallen nature, it's our old Adam. But there's something about us that wants to come to Jesus, to look at Jesus, and to say to Jesus, the claims you make, the statements you say, who you say you are and what you can do, isn't just ridiculous, it's foolish. And so there's something about our fallen nature that wants to make Jesus look foolish and certainly make those who follow Jesus look foolish for what they believe. I I read once a while back that typically this this author claimed there were three typical reasons why a person would ask a public in question, okay, in public. One is the obvious, right? They want to know the answer. Sadly, that is, according to this person, the least reason why somebody would ask a question in public. The person said the second reason is to make themselves look smart. I'm going to ask someone a question so everyone thinks I'm really intelligent with the question I'm asking. And third and finally, he noted that they would ask a question just to make the person they're asking the question to look stupid. The question is being asked to make the individual who's being asked look like a fool. Here in Matthew 22, you have been seeing Jesus respond to all sorts of different questions, all sorts of different situations. The Pharisees, two weeks ago in Matthew 22, 15 through 22, teamed up with an unlikely group of people. Their disciples did, the Herodians, who were their political opposites. They came to Jesus and they inquired about the poll tax, whether or not it would be lawful and good for a good Jewish individual to pay a tax to the hated, occupying Roman people, empire, Caesar. Jesus gave that incredibly brilliant answer. Jesus took the coin and said, whose face is on it? They said, Caesar. So Jesus said, if Caesar thinks so much about this coin to put his face on it, to stamp his image on it, then give it back to him. He said those incredible words, give to Caesar what is Caesar and to God what is God's. And here's the thing. God has stamped his image on you, on me, on all people, on your soul. Therefore, what belongs to God, which is everything, give back to God first and foremost. Let Caesar, let the government, let them have their money if they want it. Let them have their land back if they want it. They can't demand your very soul, the point that Jesus is making. It's not theirs. They can't take it. They have no ownership of it. But God does. God who created us in his image, who has saved us and redeemed us through Christ the Savior. So what we see clearly is Matthew is showing us these uh, confrontations with the religious leaders and others and Jesus during Holy Week. He, He lays it out, and you see his kind of patterns of three. Right? You saw the three miracles happening in Matthew 9 and 10. Now you're seeing a pattern of three parables happening in Matthew 21. Now in Matthew 22, you see a pattern of three questions coming to Jesus. And we are on the second of these three questions. And this is, again, much like two weeks ago, the first question in the pattern of three, a gotcha question. They're trying to do this. They're trying to play got you with Jesus. And you see how they ultimately fail. Why do they fail? All who come to Jesus with this already mindset are going to fail. All who come to scripture with this already in their mind are going to fail. And what I'm talking about is this. If a person comes to Christ and totally misunderstands the truth of what the scripture says, what they do is they ultimately put their confidence then in themselves or man and they completely miss the point of what the Bible is saying. So they're going to fail in their understanding. Now we see with this question, we'll look at in one moment here, 
More often than not, the initial question that's asked, especially in contexts like this, isn't really the main point. There's a deeper thing they're trying to get to. So the Sadducees ask an initial question, but they want a greater thing. They want a greater point to exercise on Jesus. And as you see clearly, the initial question of whose wife is this isn't really the deal. Rather, they're trying to make Jesus look foolish for the resurrection. They don't believe in the resurrection. So here Jesus deals with the real issue. He deals with life. He deals with marriage. He deals with death. And he deals with resurrection. With all that in mind, I invite your attention to Matthew 22, 23 through 33. The same day the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to him and asked him, saying, Teacher, Moses said if a man dies, having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up offspring for his brother. Now there were with us seven brothers. The first died after he had married and had no offspring left his wife to his brother. Likewise, the second also, and the third, even to the seventh. Last of all, the woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife of the seven will she be? For they all had her. Jesus answered them, You are mistaken, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given into marriage but are like angels of God in heaven. But concerning the resurrection of the dead, you have you not read what was spoken to you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. When the multitudes heard this, they were astonished at his teaching. So far, the very words of our God, we thank our God, first and foremost, for giving us this verbally inspired word of his, the only sure and reliable source of all that we believe and all that we teach. With confidence, then, these words are from God and that the Holy Spirit is loose and active and working through his words, so we pray. Sanctify us by your truth, O Lord. Your word is truth. Amen. So the text opens up with another encounter. We're not dealing with the Herodians. We're not dealing with the Pharisees or the disciples. We're dealing with this group, the Sadducees. A little bit about the Sadducees. You could call them the first theological liberals. Okay, Whereas the Pharisees were the conservatives, conservatives. Whereas the Pharisees looked at the law of God and said, you know what, I can do better. I can be more holy. My holiness can hit such an extended point. People want to be like me. And for the most part, people did. They saw the Pharisees as people that were separated and totally dedicated to living this pure and holy life here on earth. The Sadducees were absolutely nothing like them. Nothing like them. In fact, the Sadducees were a small group, mostly in the Jerusalem area, but they were incredibly powerful. They were incredibly Wealthy, They controlled the temple worship life in Jerusalem. So really the money that went for buying the sacrifices around the temple went through their hands. The money that went to the temple tax also went through their hands. So they had money, they were small, they had power, and they mostly dominated the Sahanadrin, which was the ruling council at that time. Now, the more interesting thing, though, about the Sadducees is they did not believe in the supernatural. Anything supernatural had to go. Some call them the original demythologizers of Scripture. Now, they claim they believed in the first five books of the Bible, the Torah, but everything else had to go. Daniel, Jeremiah, Joel, see you later. They held on to the first five books, although they denied all miracles. In fact, when the first five books mention any talk of angel, they said, well, this is just a literary device to enhance the moment. Supernatural, gone. You know what that means, of course. Anything they couldn't touch, they couldn't feel, they couldn't see, they couldn't taste, anything that they couldn't process according to their viewpoint rationally in their minds could not be real, and so the resurrection had to go. Life after death had to go. It was all gone. They didn't believe in that. Which brings us to the very point of the question they raised to Jesus. They're trying to make Jesus look stupid for proclaiming a resurrection from the dead. 
They're trying to make Jesus look foolish for believing in reality outside of the physical of what you can touch, feel, and experience with these five senses. They wanted Jesus to look foolish. To the Sadducees then, and many today, many today believe the same thing. They believe life is life, this is life, death is death, you're dead, you're gone, so enjoy this life now. This is all you have. You will live on through your children, you will live on in memory, you will live on in story or whatever, but you, the you right here, you're dead. When you're dead, it's over. This is their belief. And they come to Jesus to try to prove it to him. Now, their first great mistake was this. Their first great mistake is they totally missed the truth. They misunderstood what the scriptures have taught, and therefore they stubbornly held to what they thought. They put their confidence in themselves. Now, this is, this is a point I think it's worth revisiting. Not every religious thought that you might have, not every religious thought that I might have, not every religious thought that people might have is true. Just because you thought it doesn't make it true. People can be sincere and people can be genuine and they can be dead wrong eternally with their religious thoughts that are sincere and genuine. Remember, we want God's word to direct us. We want God through his word to guide us, to mold us, to shape us, to stand on. We want God's thoughts to speak to us through his word, not us coming to God and reading our thoughts into his word. There's a story about a student. He was taking his uh, final exam, and he got a C. He was pretty much a straight-A student. He got a C. So, of course, he went into the teacher, and he pointed out that his thesis followed an incredible logical argument. The progression of thought was solid. There was great grammar to it. So the teacher said to him, yes, all of that is true, but your content is wrong. It wasn't strong enough. To which the student said, yeah, but it's my opinion. The fact of the matter is just because the student's opinion was genuine and well thought out doesn't mean it wasn't wrong. It was wrong. And so we see the situation with the Sadducees. They're completely wrong about the resurrection and what the Bible teaches. So they approach Jesus. They approach him with this question. And, and I think there's reason for us to believe that they have used this question before and those who believed in the afterlife. These sorts of questions keep coming up and they will always keep coming up from an unbelieving skeptical world. And more than likely, they probably stumped a num number of other religious people who claimed in an afterlife. And so they brought this little you know, question up to them and got them and walked away smiling. Here's the question. You know it, but I'll read it again. Teacher, Moses said that if a man dies, having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up offspring for his brother. Now, therefore, there were with us seven brothers. The first died after he married and had no offspring, left his wife to his brother. The second also, and the third, all the way to the seventh. Last of all, the woman died. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife of the seven will she be for? They all were married to her. You've got to appreciate, in their minds, as wrong as they are, what they think they're giving Jesus a logical progression that is flawless. You got this woman. She married seven different men. All brothers, now they're in this afterlife that you, Jesus, talk about, this heaven. So who's she married to? Now, first of all, the first thing you're probably wondering is, what is the deal with marrying your sister-in-law? Well, Deuteronomy 25, if you'd like to read about it this week, can take care of your questions regarding this law. But a little summation is quickly this. Deuteronomy 25 shows us that if a man were married, say the oldest in the family is married, and he dies without an heir, okay, without an heir, then his next brother would marry his wife for a few reasons. One, to take care of the widow. This woman would be destitute in that society as it was. So one was to take care of her. But the second thing was also to pass on the family name through the oldest brother. And so that son, if you will, of, of the wife of the second brother to the first brother who died would be seen as the family patriarch. And so the land of the family, the name, the title, would now go through him. And so the family name and the land would be kept alive. Recall, they were building a nation. They were building tribes. We don't do that today. We don't 
do that today. It's incredibly doubtful that this situation happened, the one woman marrying the seven brothers. You probably would have thought Brother 5 would say after Brother 4 died, maybe we shouldn't marry this woman. It's not going so well for the family. But either way, the point seems to be the Sadducees are trying to make a ridiculous point to make Jesus look ridiculous for believing in the resurrection. So they're saying, Jesus, if you believe in the resurrection, if you really believe that this is true, how do these two things fit together? How does the law of Moses regarding marriage and the family and the resurrection fit? How does it go? How does it work? Whose wife will the woman be? After all, she can't be married to seven different guys in, the, in heaven, now can she? And of course, you see what's happening here. They don't care about the woman. In fact, they don't even care about marriage. All they care about is taking aim at the resurrection and what it is. Now, the problem with denying the Bible is things don't change, and so the people miss the point. Now, before we go too far with this, I said this kind of question keeps appearing, and it will keep appearing, and you've probably heard it before. It appears in so many different manifestations. Somebody might come to you and say, hey, you claim God is all good. You claim God is all powerful. Why is there suffering and pain? Answer that. Answer that. Or we talked about two weeks ago, can God make the stone that God cannot lift? These are the typical questions designed typically not because the person cares to hear an answer, but they want to make you look foolish or at least shut you up for a while in your religious beliefs. So what happens here? Look at how Jesus answers. Now, the New King James takes the Greek and and makes it sound a little more friendly than really answer. The answer, more literally, is Jesus is saying, have you never read the Bible? Do you people not get it? Are you dense? The New King James translates it, you are mistaken not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. Christ is saying, you are totally missing it. You have no idea what the Bible teaches, although you claim that you believe in what the Bible says. You actually have no idea because you don't know the power of God. You are so limited to this reality that you can't see beyond it. So you approach the afterlife as you would approach this, and you're totally wrong with your approach. First, there's two parts to this. I want to look at the second part, the power of God, and then we'll talk about marriage. In verse 32, Jesus is saying, you don't know the power of God. You try to limit God. Here's how he said it. I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Jesus here, he has their attention because he's invoking the powerful I am, Jehovah, or pronounced Yahweh, the coveted saving name of God. He's also drawing directly from a quote from Exodus, which is one of the five books that they claim to believe. He's saying God does not contradict himself in any manner. God is the God of the living, not the God of dead. God is the God that saves. By taking the name, then, Jesus takes well-respected names that the Sadducees would hold up and say, yes, these are honorable, respectable people. Abraham, father of the nation. Isaac and Jacob. Jesus is saying, you look at these guys, but you miss the big picture. You are totally missing what they were all about and what they were doing. He was saying, they lived, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they lived in a broken world. They had struggles. They had difficulty. The effects of sin affected them and caused much pain, but God has personally seen to their salvation and to helping and healing them as he does to all people. It was to Abraham that God gave the promise that all nations would be blessed through him. It was to Abraham that a descendant would be the savior of mankind who would deal with our greatest problem, sin. It was to Abraham and then his line of which you are part of, there would be a descendant who would bring fallen man back to God himself and the manifestation of that promise is right before you. And you totally missed it. Abraham's a bringer of hope and God blessed him. He was the father of a nation. The greater hope rests not in the nation, but in the one who would come from the the descendant, which is Jesus. He would be the one to crush sin. He would be the one to defeat death. He'd be the one to fulfill all the promises of God. And that one, once again, is right in front of them, and they're denying it. Clearly denying it. This one, Jesus, destroys evil. That's what Abraham wanted. All along, Abraham's dream was to be reconciled back to the Father in heaven, and the one that would do that is standing in front of him. You're missing it. The cross, 
is where Christ would bring fallen man back to imperfect God. And on the third day after his death, he would reclaim his life and all those who believe in him will reclaim life eternal and be declared righteous. Jesus says, you don't know the power of God. You're so limited in your thinking. So Jesus points them to that. First five books of the Bible taught this. First five books of the Bible showed us the awesome power of God working through his people. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob believed in God, and oh yes, they believed in the resurrection. Recall Genesis 22, Abraham goes up the mountain to offer his son as a sacrifice, knowing that God himself could raise his son back from the dead because the promise was to come through that son. Abraham believed in the resurrection. Why don't you? Okay? That's the power of God. Now we got to talk about marriage here. Marriage. Jesus addresses this so clearly. It's a wonderful institution that God has created. In fact, look at verse 30. For in the resurrection, they, that is people, that is us, will neither marry nor are given into marriage, but are like, key phrase, like angels of God in heaven. Now, in, in, in all honesty, this has been a difficult teaching for many Christians to grasp over the years, simply because the relationship between husband and wife is an incredible relationship and one of the most powerful bonds that somebody will have with another person here on earth this side of Judgment Day. That's why it's hard for several to imagine not being married in heaven. That said, marriage is a gift. It's a great gift from God. It's one of the most tremendous gifts. God is the author of marriage, and he is not downplaying its significance. He's not putting it aside by any means. He shows us that in this life, marriage brings comfort, strength, companionship, and in so many ways, marriage is a powerful teacher of the covenant love that God has for us. However, in heaven, Jesus is saying, you won't need marriage. Now, the Sadducees, they just, they don't get it. They're thinking way too small. They're thinking way too limited. They're trying to take this up here and smash it into here, and you can't do that. You just can't do that. Jesus says, like angels, you're not going to be angels, but like angels who are neither given into marriage or enter into marriage, it's not going to happen. In heaven, you are you, but you are in your glorified body right now. You can't conceive of this, but this is so because I, Jesus, say it. Remember, God's ways are higher than our ways. There's things that we can't even begin to fathom or imagine that God lays out before us. Yet Jesus is so incredibly blunt here. Jesus is saying in heaven there will be no sexual relationships, and even more remarkable, they won't be missed. He's putting in front of us. Now I want you to understand this is not a less than, but really this is a more than. Jesus is teaching us something that's incredibly different difficult for a sex-obsessed culture that we live in, who, by the way, gets things wrong. Culture gets sex wrong. It gets intimacy wrong. It gets marriage wrong. It gets companionship totally wrong. Yet Jesus is putting out before us, God knows these things, and he has them right. And in heaven, we'll be in perfect relationship in the presence of God. Uh, Revelation 21.4, again, And God shall wipe away all the tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, no more sorrow, nor crying, nor neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things have passed away. The Lord so often makes this incredible case to us throughout the scriptures that your greatest moments on earth, and there are many great and wonderful moments, and we are not downplaying those at all. But the Lord is saying they are mere shadows of the substance of the joy that you will have in the presence of Christ Jesus himself, unchecked, unbridled. The Bible uses marriage so often as a picture of the covenant love that Christ has for us. We, the church, the bride, to Christ, the bridegroom. Christ uses the wedding banquet as a picture of the joy and the celebration that we have in the presence of Jesus Christ. Also, the Bible doesn't say you're not going to know your spouse in heaven. In fact, you'll know them along with all believers in Jesus Christ, and you will enjoy their presence along with the presence of all people redeemed and saved in Christ for eternity. God is the God of the living, not the God of the dead. And eternal life is brought to us through Christ Jesus, our Savior. His name we pray.